Hey everybody, Pastor Josh here, and this is the weekly update for Redeeming Grace Church. It is Monday, March 14th of 2022, and a bunch of you have been asking why up here I only have three of my kids on my shelf. Um, and the answer is, is that the other two, the newest two, we just haven't gotten the picture frame and put their pictures in it yet. And so um, I blame Bree for this. Uh, she's at home and she's just taking care of kids. She's just a stay-at-home mom, but uh, she hasn't yet uh, prioritized uh, the frames and the pictures. That's a joke, by the way. I do want to come home and uh, and not get in trouble. But uh, but yeah, we hope to get that updated eventually soon. In fact, those pictures are kind of out of date themselves. So it's time. Thanks for reminding me. And, uh, and I guess that's an indication that maybe some of you actually even watch these videos, which I sometimes wonder. Anyway, some things that are coming up is that we have our Discover RGC seminar that will be beginning uh, at 9.15 this coming Sunday, March 20th, and this is an opportunity to get to know the church. Uh, we walk through the gospel, our statement of faith, why church membership matters, our church covenant, um, worship and giving, and just how things work at our church, and then we call people to join our church formally as covenant members. And uh, coming to the class doesn't commit you to becoming a member, but it is a prerequisite. It's part of it, and uh, I would love everybody that considers Redeeming Grace Church their church home to go through it at least one time uh, so that you can get a feel for what we're doing and why we're doing it and why biblically we're doing what we're doing and how you can be involved in it. So it'll start this Sunday, 9-15. Uh, another thing is that uh, Life Inc. is having their classes. Life Inc. is a division of Love Inc. and they have equipping classes for people to just make their lives better. And so here's the flyer for that. It's going to be hosted at our mother church, South Canyon Baptist Church, on Thursday nights starting March 22nd. It's going to run for, I think it's eight weeks. And I would just encourage you to consider uh, jumping in, either helping with food, helping with child care, or maybe taking a class. Here's some of the classes that are being offered. One is Common Sense Parenting. Another is Financial Freedom. Uh, a third class is When Helping Hurts. We've gone through that as a church. Uh, a fourth class is Overcoming Emotions That Destroy, really practical uh, look at, at emotions. Uh, Christianity Explored, a basic gospel presentation over the course of a few weeks. And then Healing Hearts, this class will focus on acknowledging and healing the wounds of the heart and mind that we all experience through trials of life. So if you'd like to participate in these classes or be involved in some way, um, would love for you to consider that. This, this is, if you've done a furniture delivery, some of those people have earned furniture by taking a class. And so it's our neighbors. It's, it's the people that we live among, uh, that we would love to have come to our church that are coming to these classes. And, um, and, the, and the goal is to equip them, provide them with a meal for their family, equip them in some sort of life skill, and then also to do so while connecting with other Christians. And I would love for us to be some of the Christians they connect with. Um, so one reason why I'm promoting this is our mother church is hosting it, and we'd love to partner with them. Number two, uh, we have a close partnership with Love, Inc., and I would love for us to build relationships. They're kind of gathering uh, the fish, <laughs> using a fishing metaphor. They're kind of gathering the fish for us, and we can easily just come and build relationships and invite people uh, to our church, the, the very people that live in our neighborhoods. And then number three, our own Scott Martin, who is moving here uh, to actually lead this program at Love, Inc. So he's going to be in charge of this, and I would love for our church to already, by the time he gets here, be partnering with this ministry and helping uh, see his ministry there as an extension of our ministry of the church and that we as fellow members of the church are with him and are, are wanting to support him and make his job better and easier. And, uh, another thing is that we're going to be baptizing on Easter Sunday. So if you've not yet been baptized, then I would love to have that conversation with you. If you have questions, I'd love to answer those questions. I've got some great materials that you can work through on your own. We can also sit and talk personally whatever it takes uh, to help you understand what that is. And then I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will lead you to follow Jesus in that way. It's a beautiful thing. We're going to be baptizing someone any, anyway on that day. So to have a, multiple baptisms on Easter Sunday would be glorious. I would love that and uh, would encourage you to consider it. We have a neighborhood breakfast on April 2nd in the Minaluzahan Senior Center. Let Bob or myself know if you could help out either in the kitchen doing tasks and cooking and cleaning or if you want to come and just be social around the tables, that's typically what I do. And uh, it, it's been a great opportunity to, to meet anywhere. I think there's been anywhere from like 60 to 100 people that have come to these breakfasts. And it's just been a wonderful opportunity. We've even seen some of them start coming to our church, at least occasionally. 
Uh, so would encourage you to consider jumping in on this quarterly neighborhood breakfast and the opportunity that it is to meet some of our neighbors and, uh, and build relationships, share the gospel, pray, invite people into our fellowship. So uh, with that, I promised some of you that I would answer a couple of sensitive questions about Genesis chapter 38 and 39. Particularly, the Onan story raises two big questions that I want to address right now. So while I gave a parental warning last week about the sermon itself, and some of you experienced the sermon uh, yesterday, hopefully it wasn't too controversial or too uh, scandalous, uh, but I do want to warn you that in this video I am going to talk about that for just a few minutes, and so if you're watching this with kids or publicly, it's about to get weird perhaps, um, but I do want to address a couple of questions. I promised that, and so let's just go right at the awkward questions in five, four, three, two, one. So the Onan story, just to refresh your memory, um, Tamar is given to Ur, Ur gets put to death for being wicked, and now Judah, uh, Ur and Onan's father, commands his son Onan to take Tamar as a wife and bear sons for his older brother uh, to carry on his life. It's called leveret marriage. It was just an ancient way of preserving the family line. It seems weird to us that a brother would conceive children with his brother's widow. Uh, but you're talking life and death. You're talking family, family lineage, lineage, and there's not medical things. There's not social safety nets. You have to have a mechanism for doing that, and that was one way to honor the family was that your brother's widow who has, doesn't have children can, in a sense, receive her husband's genetic material, so to speak, from a brother so that the family line can continue. Well, what happens is that Onan's commanded to do this. It's clear this is what he should do to honor his brother, to honor his brother's widow, to honor the family line, and ultimately to honor God. So this is something that is a good thing that Onan is supposed to take Tamar and conceive children with her. And what it tells us in the story is that Onan does take Tamar and has sex with her and then um, spills his semen on the ground is what it says. So in a sense, he is not allowing her to uh, conceive and therefore he does what is wicked in the sight of God and God puts him to death as well. So a couple of questions this raises. The, one, the first one's pretty easy. The second one is more complicated. The first question is this. Does God put Onan to death for masturbation? A couple hundred years ago, in order to combat the concerns about masturbation, um, Christians would point to the Onan story and say, spilling your seed um, is, a, is an abomination before God, and uh, put, that's why God put him to death. It was so often referenced that actually the act of masturbation was called Onanism. Um, but that's not what's happening. I mean, you can just clearly read in the text that's not what's happening. And so actually, if you want to think biblically about that issue and that act, you, I think you'd be better off going to Matthew chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus. Just listen to what he says, especially in light of that particular activity. Uh, Matthew 5, 27, you have heard it said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus is already telling us that it's not the outward acts, so to speak. It's not the spilling of the seed in and of itself. It's the lustful intent of the heart that convicts one of adultery. The act matters, and the act is bad, but also it's what's going on in the heart that also counts as sin. So the act of masturbation, if it's done in any sort of lustful intent, would therefore be considered a sin. Let's go a little bit further in verse 29, this very same flow of thought, Jesus says, I, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Again, this is in the context of lust. So this would mean that pornography would clearly be sin. If, it's, if there is a lustful intent to the looking, your eye is being used for lustful intent of the heart, then if your right hand causes you to sin, tear, or your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. So it's a sin deserving of hell. And you'd be better off dealing with the source of sin than being under the judgment of that sin. Verse 30. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. So the Onan story is really not the place to uh, address the masturbation issue. The scripture never directly anywhere speaks positively or negatively about that act specifically. But I do think that you have principles that Jesus himself lays out in Matthew chapter 5 that would help you understand where that fits in, um, in kind of the matrix of what is sin and what not sin. So I'll leave that with you. Here's the trickier question. 
and you're going to watch me stumble through this because it's challenging to try to figure out and discern what the right answer is. Um, is the Onan story uh, tell us anything about birth control? Well, I think there's a couple ways to think about this. One is that if a child is conceived, the moment of conception, it is a image bearer. It is a person. I think we can go to Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So I think it's very clearly clear there that David is speaking of himself as a person even while being unformed. So the moment that sperm and egg come together and create a life, conception happens, you have an image bearer. And so any prevention or destruction of that embryo would be murder. So in that sense, controlling or preventing the growth and life and birth of that concepted child, if that's a way to say it, uh, would be sin. Clearly, that would be guilty of murder. And, uh, and so, um, so Christians can clearly, with great moral clarity, and I think plenty of Bible verses argue that the moment that conception happens, that should that is now a protected life, and any destruction or prevention of that life's birth uh, would clearly be sin, and clearly be outside the bounds of that. The more complicated question is this: is preventing it is preventing conception of children in some measure a sin? And I think the answer is maybe. I think maybe depending on the. Uh, intention and situation because that, that's actually what's happening in the Onan situation is that it's not that a child is being conceived and then destroyed. Uh, in fact, Judah almost tries to do that a little bit later in the story. But the fact that he is preventing the conception of a child. And now there's a context there of leveret marriage and what is owed. And so it's not exactly the same context as a young couple today trying to determine how many kids they have or when to have them. But I do think that it's worth asking the question as Christians and especially the young families within our church, we live in kind of an interesting age in that we can biologically control a whole lot more than we ever could in the past. So we're having to wrestle with ethical and morality questions that are somewhat unique in human history. Obviously, the organizing and arranging the conception of a child is not new, but our ability to actually tangibly control that is is uh, it causes us to think about that. And uh, I, would just, I would just encourage all of you to think and pray about that and just um, not just assume that you already necessarily know the answer to that question, that you already are going, yep, we're going to have four kids and we're going to be done, or we're just going to have two kids and then we're going to be done. Going, mm, What does God's word actually say about that? And is exercising sovereignty over when and how many uh, image bearers come into the world, is that really under our own prerogative to just determine at our own whims? I, I think that's a question worth asking. And uh, it's not one that I know that I necessarily have uh, the exact answer on, uh, but a passage like this does make me ask the question. And I would encourage you as couples to maybe pray through and think through that question as well. And when you're talking about the production and timing of image bearers of God who will spend eternity forever. I think we handle that maybe a bit more flippantly than we ought in our culture, even Christian culture. And I would just encourage you to think about it, pray about it, search the scriptures and see what does most honor God. And maybe it's a little different than what I think uh, my dream family and dream timing. Um, maybe it's different than my preferences. And so I just leave that in your hands to think about and uh, to pray about and to maybe discuss within community. Uh, with great candor, great grace, in the hopes that all of us can live lives that are most pleasing to God. So thanks for letting me riff on that for a few minutes. Hopefully there's some helpful things. If that raises more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Even if they're awkward, I'm okay with that. And so um, God bless you. Thank you for uh, taking the time to let me process these things with you. Um, and I hope that you'll jump in on something this week, and we'll see you soon. Bye.